Hi, ActiveHistory.ca is happy to present a recording of Funke Aladegebi's talk, Black Power for Black Education in Toronto, 1950s to 1970s. It is part of the 2013 History Matters Lecture Series, sponsored by the Toronto Public Library. You can find recordings of other talks from the 2013 History Matters Lecture Series at ActiveHistory.ca. Thank you so much, Jill, for that great introduction. And thank you to the organizers of the History Matters um, lecture series. I really appreciate uh, History Matters, that's uh, activehistory.ca, and also York University, as well as, <laughs> as, well as um, all of my colleagues that are here today who are coming to talk to me. I guess I should stand up because it's, I'm in this weird space and I, I, I tend not, I didn't want to stand up, Professor Johnson, because I'm going to be hunching over. But um, I'll try my best to, to go back and forth between these, these two kind of places. Anyway, so uh, in honor of this talk today, I wore this shirt, which is um, a shirt by the Toronto uh, clothing line called Live It, Wear It. And I thought this uh, shirt was really important or spoke to kind of this discussion today because even though um, this shirt and this clothing line um, is created by kind of a Toronto-based organization. They speak specifically to uh, the 1968 Olympic um, Games in which Tommy Smith as well as John Carlos kind of saluted um, the, and using kind of this black power ideology and iconography. And so I think it's interesting that this Toronto-based t-shirt company uses this to um, speak to kind of this cross-border um, discussion about black power and what it meant for black consciousness in the Canadian um, atmosphere. And so today my discussion hopes to do just that, is to look at the ways in which Torontonians and black Canadians organized around um, black power rhetoric uh, through educational programs to unify kind of di its diverging black population. And today I define black power as an extension of the civil rights movement that began in the 1950s, um, but also that emphasized racial pride and social equality through the creation of political and social programs throughout uh, North America. I also define African Canadian to Canadians to look at Canada's diverse black populations that came into Toronto during this time period specifically looking at uh, Canadian-born blacks, West Indian or Caribbean-born blacks, American as well as African migrants that were coming into the area during this time period. And so um, during this time period, Canada is really starting to um, pilot itself on an international stage, uh, promoting itself as a peacekeeping nation and one in where um, it was anti-racist, right? And so for a long time, while it had long had a black pre presence during this time period, um, it was really starting to look at itself or appropriate this discussion of it being a Canaan land, right? A place in which, you know, enslaved blacks came into Canada and obtained their freedom in the great white north and equality. However, Canada's growing black population was really beginning to question and um, question the ways in which um, Canada had promoted these citizenship rights and really starting to say that essentially, hey, we aren't getting these rights and we're going to start to advocate for them. And they largely did this around um, black power, using black power rhetoric and also African Canadian um, education, educational and cultural programs throughout the city to do it. And so I hope to discuss Toronto today as a case study, really to highlight uh, a, a unique brand of radicalism that starts to happen in post-World War II Toronto um, that speaks to specific issues of this area. And so my presentation today will cover three main, um, three main areas. One, I will look at the ways in which uh, African Canadians use black power rhetoric to unify its diverging black population. Secondly, I hope to look at how black organizing, organizations based in Toronto used education as a political and at times radical tool um, to combat racial injustice. And finally, I hope to discuss the challenges that were facing these African Canadian communities in their quest for racial equality. And so as I said earlier, Canada had long had a black presence since the early 17th century. Um, but at the time, it remained relatively small with Africans, Canadians, or African descended peoples in kind of a relatively small longer number and, having, and remaining in small pockets throughout um, the country. However, and so as a result, kind of black immigration during this time period 
was uh, before 1961 was actually only comprised of 1.52 percent of uh, the immigrant population at the time, largely because of uh, restrictive immigration programs that gave preferential treatment to European migrants and excluded uh, racialized bodies at the time. However, in 1961, with the implementation, or sorry, in 1967, with the implementation of the point system, migrants now were being evaluated based on age, occupational skill, uh, as well as education. And as a result, there was a huge influx in the skill and professional black populations that were coming from areas like Africa and um, uh, the Caribbean, more specifically. And so between the years of 1961 and 1967, uh, Canada's black immigrant population had more than doubled to about 12.67%, with black migrants coming to areas like Montreal, Toronto, and Halifax. So they largely gravitated to these urban centers uh, uh, where they obviously had connections and felt at home, I guess. Um, <clears throat> And so uh, I, the black population at the time did not only just increase kind of broadly across the provinces, it also increased dramatically in Canadian educational institutions. More specifically, in the post-secondary sector, uh, Canada had seen like a huge influx in the black migrants that were entering these uh, universities. So prior to in the year of 1955, for example, the West Indian population in Canada had only comprised of about 450 students throughout their various universities. By 1965, this number had more than doubled to about uh, 4,000 um, stu students coming into educational institutions throughout the area. And uh, these student populations tended to gravitate to various universities such as McGill, Queens, Sir George Williams, Mount Allison, and Dalhousie universities. And at these universities, they also created various uh, institutions or cultural institutions that spoke to their specific needs as African descended peoples. The Black Students Union at the University of Toronto and the Black People's Movement at York University were two such examples of these organizations that were created during this time period. And it's also important to note that a lot of the migrants that were coming or immigrants that were coming into these Canadian institutions were largely coming from areas that had recently been involved in anti-colonial struggles or liberation and independence movements in their um, birth homes. So I'm talking about Ghana in 1957, Nigeria in 1960, Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica in 1962, and Barbados in 1966. So because of this kind of um, consciousness and involvement in the liberation movements of their birth home, they came with an acute awareness of how to organize and mobilize in Canada. And that's not to say that um, they were only organizing in the post-secondary sector. In fact, Toronto, the Toronto Board of Education had reported that by 1970, they uh, had seen thousands of English-speaking blacks entering their schools, with as many as 30% of their student populations as being black during this time period. So really, uh, Canada had to be kind of wake up to its increasing racialized presence, more specifically, its mobile, younger, um, more educated, more skilled, and more vocal presence at the time period. And so, in 1968, uh, Sidney Williams, who was a consultant, uh, released a brief um, highlighting whether or not he believed that, that there was going to be a black power movement um, in Canada. And in that brief, uh, Williams kind of went around the city talking to the younger uh, militant kind of bodies that were starting to develop in, the, in, uh, in Toronto. And he had documented this kind of increased presence of a militant black, a younger in age kind of group that was starting to emerge. And so this is an example of one of the young militants that um, Williams had actually t talked to. And in, um, in the report, Williams kind of says, or Williams cites this young student as saying, quote, black power contains a certain finality, a certain terror, the last action by a man who has been irrecoverably cornered. And it must be understood by blacks and by whites that terror and fear and violence are constituent parts of a social movement which seeks to reverse all attitudes, the conditions, and the livelihoods of one group at the expense of another group which rightly or wrongly is considered by the former group to be oppressive. And so as a result of these swelling student numbers and increasing political and social awareness, black student groups were gaining more mobility and were also getting more angry about um, 
the ways in which they were being treated in the Canadian atmosphere. And I would say this kind of in, this discussion and increased mobility kind of takes a different tone than had been previously used by African Canadian leadership at the time. Uh, and this young militant leader um, that Williams kind of discusses, he says that his philosophy had changed from one of nonviolence in previous decades to one of more um, agitation. And I think what his what his discussion or this young kind of militant person is actually reflecting is a black power movement or black power rhetoric that is being used that char that is characterized specifically by age, date of birth, or place of birth, I should say, and also the increase of black power. Um, doctrination and discussions in mainstream media outlets during this time period. And also in his brief, kind of, Williams essentially kind of indicates a changing, in the, a changing shift in the ideologies between the younger, um, I guess, not necessarily Canadian-born black groups that are coming into this area, and the older African-Canadian presence and leadership that was starting to develop or came into this area at the time. However, in in uh, Williams' discussion, actually, he, he says that there was, still, there was still no kind of organized vanguard that was saying that violent action should actually happen, despite the fact that they were borrowing this rhetoric. He says there was still no organized movement to disrupt the social order based on social violence. And still, there were several organizations in Toronto that directly borrowed this kind of violent, more aggressive tone um, happening throughout the city. The Afro-American Progressive Association, which was uh, based in, an organization based in Toronto, not only borrowed direct language from the black power movement that was happening in the United States, but they actually encouraged a mobilization um, surrounding the Black Panther Party. And this is interesting because in popular discourses at the time, the Black Panther Party was considered to be one of America's most violent black organizations. And so in many ways, in calling for an alliance with the Black Panther Party, um, organizations like the AAPA uh, also addressed its kind of violent tone and its need for urgency and agitation. And so in a, a memo that was issued out in February 25th in 1970, the AAPA actually sent out a memo to all uh, black organizations calling, kind of like sending out this manifesto and a rally call for black unification across various philosophies. And in that memo, AAPA kind of says, quote, Today we see our brothers and sisters, oh sorry, today we see our brothers lighting the way with a fire so bright, so fervent. We can see our manhood, feel it, taste it, and luxuriate in its warmth, its joys, its aspirations. We will have our manhood. This eternal flame roaring in our veins must never go out. We must all fan the embers into flames of liberation. The brothers and sisters have lighted the fire with their blood and their lives. This courageous sacrifice cannot and must not die because of the want of outrage or the change of the clergy. We must support our brothers and sisters. The AAPA supports the Black Panther Party 100%. And so, often younger in age, these blacks believed that aggressive action would allow for a drastic change and more immediate attention to the causes that were facing blacks in Toronto. They borrowed the rhetoric from the black power movement, invited black power activists to their functions, and took a more direct stance to the ways in which they organized and tried to unify across various uh, bodies. And so recognizing that one of the ways in which uh, the state had quelled black organizing at the time, AAPA called instead for all black organizations to unify and to rally around various causes specifically um, promoted by the Black Panther Party. They embraced a black radicalism and a revolution that left a lot of people fearful that the racial discontent that was happening in the United States would somehow spill over into Canada. And so uh, in hoping to kind of do this, um, I'm showing that you know, there's clear direct connections to the ways in which black power rhetoric was used in Toronto, but I also will talk about the ways in which they changed this language to fit the Canadian scene. The 1971 Black People's Conference was one such an organization that worked, hoped to unify all black uh, Canadian organizing bodies as one. It was spearheaded by the, black, the National Black Action Committee and the National Council on Black Education and Culture, and hoped to unify all Canadian-born, West Indian, and American-born blacks as one. 
It also hoped, uh, one of the main themes of the event was actually to have a free and united Africa so that all blacks could truly be liberated. So, and I think that this is what characterizes black organizing at the time, is one, its ability to try and unify its diverging black populations, and two, the need to speak across um, kind of this national border, and I'm saying like the United States, but I'm talking more internationally as well, the need to unify across um, all borders, and obviously looking to Africa as um, home, as diasporic peoples. And one of the main conference organizers at this event was called Sister Okosa, or June Ward, and she was a first year commerce student at the University of Toronto. And she really reflects kind of this idea of one, the ways in which black power, um, black power rhetoric was used to mobilize through educational initiatives, but also two, the ways in which they recognized their difference um, within their own larger organization, or at least in trying to unify. And in that, in, t in speaking about this uh, conference, she says, quote, black people are not homogenous. Even though we work towards the same goals, the liberation of black people, we have different approaches. We think that education is important. It is vital. Uh, and so despite the fact that Sister Okosa was involved in her liberation movement of her birth home in Guyana, I don't think that these ideologies necessarily conflicted with her conception of blackness in Canada. Rather, I think that her experiences in Guyana informed the ways in which she mobilized and organized in um, Toronto, more specifically looking at the intersecting and competing identities that form black consciousness in Canada. And as a result, this kind of growing black consciousness that was developing spoke across various nations, ethnicities, genders, and uh, sexualities. And in hoping, sorry, in hoping to, to unify across uh, various organizations. The Black People's Conference also supported various liberation movements in uh, Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau. And they also worked more specifically to organize within their own local environments, right? So uh, at the time, around 200, over 200 delegates had attended the Black People's Conference, um, which was really wide, and they had spanned various provinces and everything. So. Attendees at the Black Education Project, excuse me, attendees at the Black People's Conference also worked in close conjunction and supported the Black Education Project. Uh, the Black Education Project uh, began in 1969 to take the responsibility of giving brothers and sisters a chance to develop the skills necessary for the survival and for building a strong black community. And in its organizational mandates, BEP had talked about the rise of three specific things that created its organizations or caused it to start. One, the rise of Pan-Africanist black power, and two, young West Indian immigrants coming from countries recently involved in anti-colonialist struggles, and three, the widespread impact of the Sir George Williams affair, in which white and black students staged a sit-in at the university's computer center, causing direct confrontation with the Montreal police and thousands of dollars in damages. So as part of its mandate, BEP implemented tutoring programs for school-aged children, as well as helped their parents to upgrade themselves if they wanted to attend the program. They also worked in creating a remedial program uh, for young students uh, at the time who were having difficulty in the mainstream educational uh, in the mainstream educational schools. And finally, uh, they also created um, they also took responsibility for the cultural and recreational programs throughout the community. And so they would take they created arts programs. Um, they had dance programs for various school-aged children as well as their parents. And in fact, they also took students and parents to places of cultural relevance, right? So they took them to, as for example, the farming community of North Buxton, and also took them to the Black Muslim Mosque in Buffalo, all calling for this kind of increased racial pride and the teaching of Black history that necessarily didn't stand inside uh, Canadian schools at the time. And so it's also important to note that while BEP had a lot of kind of uh, positive and progressive gains in its schools, uh, it for the most part stood outside of the mainstream educational institutions. And so this meant that while Ontario at the time was increasing funding into Canadian education, into Canadian educational institutions and um, also increasing its intervention into Ontario schools, concerns that were facing the African-Canadian population largely stood outside of its purview. Uh, 
And so as a result, uh, main concerns facing the black community, such as the teaching of black history in schools and also the streaming of African Canadian students into vocational programs stood outside of educational mandates, right? And this really becomes important to the ways in which we understand the issues that might be facing African Canadian students today. We can talk about that later if we want. Anyway, so I think this is a really interesting comic, kind of discussing the ways in which um, African Canadian students were left disadvantaged through the streaming of uh, racialized students at the time. And so uh, as part of this kind of uh, goal to unify uh, various black organizers and um, educational programs, uh, BEP also worked in close conjunction with the Thorncliffe Park School. The Thorncliffe Park School opened its doors in June 20th, 1970, and was run by the Black Heritage Association and catered to nearly 100 students. The school met on alternative Saturdays at a church hall of chapel in the park in the Thorncliffe Park area. Um, and at the time, the school had two main mandates. Uh, one was to teach black history, and two was to instill racial pride amongst uh, the African Canadian population. They worked diligently to train uh, teachers to kind of meet these increasing demands of black studies in their, in their area that necessarily wasn't being found in the mainstream school system. And so Harold Hoyt uh, was a reporter at Contrast newspaper. He reported in 1962 kind of this connection or, or black unifying consciousness that was exemplified through this educational institution. And he says, quote, the art classes have an African bend Children draw black images. They create in their own minds a self-awareness, a self-pride that is not encouraged in the main education system. The result will be a generation of blacks who will demand respect based on their own pride and dignity as a people of tremendous capacity and achievement. And so it's important to kind of um, highlight the ways in which the Thorncliffe Park School and BEP were really trying to create and foster this teaching of black history and also acknowledge the black presence in Canada in not, I would say, in different ways than was being done before because they still remained very closely connected and um, maintained strong alliances to liberation movements uh, globally. And so uh, it's also important to note that um, the organizers at Thorncliffe Park School wanted to emphasize, especially in this news report, that uh, the school was not a breeding ground for racial hatred, um, but rather to do discuss the black presence throughout history. And so the language of reporters at this time period kind of speaks to this increasing tension about racial disunity that's starting to happen in Canada, and really this fear of black activism that's starting to take place. And once again, so despite all of the really positive things that Thorncliffe Park School was doing, it still re, um, received a lot of resistance from mainstream in the mainstream institution, uh, and this becomes really important, right? So, for example, members of Thorncliffe Park School had reported that there was a church organist who continued to play in rooms that were designated for black students. They also discussed that there was a church, uh, the church secretary would actually eavesdrop on the teachers and accused the teachers of teaching racial prejudice. So there was this clear kind of um, fear that schools like Thorncliffe Park School were not places of teaching racial pride, but really reteaching racial indoctrination, right? And so fearing that because of all, a lot of the discussion of rioting and chaos that was happening in the United States, there was this increased fear that that would also be happening in the Canadian scene. And schools like Thorncliffe Park would be places where this indoctrination would take place. And so, um, for example, whether or not this, this uh, idea of kind of black activism or the sphere of black activism was real or not, it was definitely discussed in mainstream discourses. So in 1970, the uh, Toronto Daily Star actually reported that FBI Assistant Director William C. Sullivan had come to speak to Torontonians at a commercial travelers association saying that black radicals from America were crossing the border to spread their doctrine of revolution into Canada. And so whether this was perceived or not, this was definitely a discussion that was happening and it meant that schools like uh, Thorncliffe Park School were received with hostility. And furthermore, it did not mean that 
black radical organizations only received hostility from um, within from mainstream institutions, but they actually also received resistance from the African Canadian community itself. And so maintaining a moderate stance that, in, that was encouraged black unity and self-appreciation, larger organizations based in the city worked diligently to remove themselves from anything that was deemed as too radical. And on, for example, on March 1968, the president of the Jamaican Canadian Association denounced black extremists for misrepresenting what they saw as the African Canadian experience. Instead, he called for the black bourgeoisie, middle class businessmen, academics, and intellectuals to take back the leadership from these black extremists and instead to foster cooperation. And so believing that black radicalism was um, damaging to the images of blacks, uh, organizations like the Canadian, uh, J Jamaican Canadian Association kind of started to um, fear that this direct agitation would lead to um, a resistance and hosti um, increased hostility that would face the black community. And I would say that would face, I guess, the older um, leadership tenants that were happening at the time, or the work that these older leadership groups were doing. And he was, uh, M.W. Thompson, who was the president of the Jamaican Canadian Association at the time, was not the only one to uh, fear this increased hostility, right? Dr. Daniel G. Hill, who was the director of the Ontario Human Rights Commission at the time, actually denounced that there would ever be a black power movement that would take hold in Canada. And so in writing to the labor minister in 1968, he spoke directly in response to uh, Williams's brief about the advent of black power happening in Canada. And in that uh, letter, he says, quote, movements of violent social protest among Negroes in the United States invariably spring from a physical ghetto in which poverty-stricken Negroes are confined. Fortunately, those few Canadian Negroes who live in Ontario are not faced with the overwhelmingly depressing problems that plague American uh, Negroes in urban areas. I seriously doubt that given the same population of Ontario Negroes and the different social climate that exists here, that a serious black power movement could take hold. And in many ways, Hill was right about the inability of black Canadians to mobilize larger so social movements that spanned across various cities and provinces. Black Canadians still did not have the numbers to launch effective boycotts, nor did they have the consistent and identifiable, er uh, uh, consistent and identifiable areas of totally segregated places um, to essentially go and, and fight. Right? So it meant that uh, the ways in which they organized was often inconsistent and based on demography and the ways in which um, discrimination was felt in these specific areas. However, it is these very kinds of things that uh, Hill highlights as an American problem that attendees at the Black People's Conference as well as uh, the Black Education Project highlighted as specific issues that were affecting the African Canadian community. And I'm talking about policing, access to employment, housing, and obviously equal education. However, moving away from the rhetoric of militancy borrowed by the Black Power Movement, it seems that these larger organizations instead took positions that were characteristic of 18th century Black organizing at this time. And this largely invo involved the lobbying and petitioning and um, cooperating with larger bodies to e essentially cause effective change. And so in trying to separate themselves from mainstream media images of violence, uh, rioting and chaos, organizations like the Ontario Human Rights Commission and the Jamaican Canadian Association worked to denounce and at times quell the most radical sectors of Toronto's black organizing community. And it's interesting to note that despite these two ideologies, one thing that both uh, camps kind of agreed on was the education of African Canadian students and the discussion of racial his uh, of black history in schools. And so in carrying traditions of community uplift and cooperation, larger black organizations were successful in appealing for government involvement and the acknowledgement of racial injustice. However, they did this by kind of quelling the smaller groups who didn't necessarily follow their more moderate stance. And so despite remaining in the community for about seven years, 
uh, organizations like BEP and Thor Thorncliffe Park School also faced uh, a lot of challenges surrounding funding and support. And so in newspapers, they would be constantly appealing uh, to the African Canadian community to provide funding, uh, to provide volunteer support, to really sustain their programs for a longer period of time. Uh, BEP even reported that even a, a year after it was um, already in operation, they, ha they couldn't access adequate telephones, didn't have enough textbooks for their students, and didn't even have enough facilities to essentially eat. So it really was um, a difficult kind of time for these organizations and I think it also reflects the challenges that were facing the black community itself and their inability to really uh, help support these systems because of the systemic dis discrimination that's very much in place at the time. Um, and so, uh, in trying to kind of sustain their programs and expand, uh, organizations like BEP apply, apply to states uh, for funds. And for example, in 1973, BEP actually received a $10,000 grant from the Secretary of State of Multiculturalism. And I argue that, uh, and other, other scholars argue too, that as a result of gaining this government support, uh, organizations like BEP had to make several concessions, largely surrounding uh, vo their volunteer requirements as well as board organization in order to comply to funding criteria to receive this money. And so I say that because they had to make all of these concessions, they lost their more radical sector in trying to um, really fit into the state model. Scholars like Agnes Kalis say that the state co-opted and regulated the black power movement in several ways. For example, through an appeasement policy of multiculturalism and by funding some African Canadian organizing, the state initiatives worked against the continuation of self-supporting militant African Canadian organizations by sidetracking their energies and stifling protest. And so, in hoping to forge alliances with one another, these programs did, however, recognize the importance of Pan-Africanism and Black radicalism during this time period. They adopted but also changed the language of the Black Power Movement in relation to the Canadian context. In hopes of being viewed as less militant and less threatening, some of these organizations tried to emphasize a, a non-aggressive form of racial pride. It seemed that the goal was not to take equality by force, but to unify African Canadians in such a way that they could no longer be ignored. And so black radicalism differed in Toronto from its ability to recognize and acknowledge its diverging black population, but also in its inability to foster a large scale social uh, movement, um, but rather worked in conjunction with smaller social kind of uh, organizations that worked to tackle racial injustice that was specific to the city. The need to tell the story speaks to the words of uh, black militant Rocky Jones, and he was considered to be the Stokely Carmichael of Canada, but what he says I think really resonates with the experiences and connections of education and African Canadian organizing at the time. And he says, we've got a school system that says nothing about us or to us or for us. That is killing us. If this continues, where will we be? We will be without a people. We will be exterminated. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. You've been listening to a recording of Funke Aladejebe's talk, Black Power for Black Education in Toronto, 1950s to 1970s. It is part of the 2013 History Matters Lecture Series, sponsored by the Toronto Public Library. You can find recordings of other talks from the 2013 History Matters Lecture Series at activehistory.ca.